But we're in Luke chapter 6 and verse 12 to 26, following on from where we've been. It was at this time that he went off to the mountain to pray. And he spent the whole night in prayer to God. And when day came, he called his disciples to him and chose 12 of them, whom he also named as apostles. And Simon, whom he also named Peter, and Andrew, his brother, and James, and John, and Philip, and Bartholomew, and Matthew, and Thomas, and James, the son of Alphaeus, and Simon, who was called the Zealot, and Judas, the son of James, and Judas Iscariot, who became a traitor. And Jesus came down with them and stood on a level place, and there was a large crowd of his disciples and a great throng of people from all Judea and Jerusalem and the coastal region of Tyre and Sidon, who had come to hear him and to be healed of their diseases. And those who were troubled with unclean spirits were being cured, and all the people were trying to touch him, for power was coming from him and healing them all. And he turned his gaze toward the disciples and began to say, Blessed are you who are poor for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you who hunger now, for you will be satisfied. Blessed are you who weep now, for you shall laugh. Blessed are you when men hate you and ostracize you and insult you and scorn your name as evil for the sake of the Son of Man. Be glad in that day and leap forth for joy, for behold, your reward is great in heaven, for in the same way the fathers used to treat the prophets. But woe to you who are rich, for you are receiving your comfort in full. Woe to you who are well fed now, for you shall be hungry. Woe to you who laugh now, for you shall mourn and weep. Woe to you when all men speak well of you, for their fathers used to treat the false prophets in the same way. In this reading we have three distinct sections. Firstly we see Jesus praying and identifying the twelve disciples. Secondly, we see Jesus healing all who came to him. And then thirdly, we hear him giving instructions uh, concerning life in the kingdom of God. And so we're going to consider all of those three elements as we go through this morning. But first, let's remind ourselves of the the background. Chapter 4, Jesus has announced the kingdom mandate, the year of the Lord's favor. And we said last week, we live in the time of God's favor right now. We are blessed because this is the time of the Lord's favor, from the time he came first time to the time he comes again. And then he was, he had, he's been demonstrating this mandate through his teaching, through healing the sick, through delivering people from demons. And he's also been on a collision course with the religious authorities because he's been challenging their view of, how, of the kingdom and how it comes. He's denounced their approach as old wineskins, And he's told them that he has the authority to redefine what kingdom obedience looks like. And finally, he's been rejected by the scribes and Pharisees, the religious leaders of Israel. And so having done that, he's now cleared the ground so that he can begin to build his kingdom, the kingdom of God. And so we come to the calling of the disciples. Firstly, Jesus didn't take the calling of those first disciples or apostles lightly we're told he spent the whole night in prayer and he also went up a mountain and in scriptures mountains are associated with divine encounters and revelation anyone in the old testament who wanted an encounter with god went up a mountain moses went up the mountain and received the ten commandments and so jesus goes up the mountain to pray to seek god and to get revelation concerning his disciples I actually really appreciate going up a mountain and seeking God. If you've, ever, if you've never been up a mountain, even a little hill, do it. It's a place of encounter. And we're told he spent all night in prayer. He wanted to be sure that each one was handpicked according to the Father's will. And even the choosing of Judas was no accident. So why did Jesus pick 12 disciples? Why didn't he pick 11 or 13? Well, to understand why he chose 12, we need to go back to the constitution of Israel itself and the 12 tribes who were descended from Jacob's sons. The choosing of 12 was, was symbolic. Essentially, Jesus was declaring that he was reconstituting Israel and it, it would no longer be defined by ethnic descent. 
Yes, they were all Jews, but they were not from the 12 different tribes of Israel. They were chosen by a different criterion, the purpose of God. They were not chosen because they were perfect. They were not chosen because they were well-educated. Quite the opposite. They were chosen because God said, those are the ones I want to re-establish a new kingdom. And it's the same with you and I. We didn't come to faith by accident or simply by the fact that being in the right place at the right time. Each one of us is here because God chose to bring us to himself. Unless you're an Arminian, of course, this morning. Let the reader understand. We're chosen. Not, we're not chosen because we deserve it. We're not chosen because we're the best or even the most worthy. We're simply chosen according to God's foreknowledge. And how that works with our free will, I'm not going to go into this morning. Nor am I going to discuss some, why some are chosen and some are not. I believe everyone, however, however much light they receive, has a choice to follow God. But somehow our free will works with God's foreknowledge to bring us to faith. And also, it's not for us to know who is destined for salvation. Our responsibility is to simply make Jesus known and leave the rest with him. But know this morning that you are chosen. You are God's choice. He looked through the eons of time and said, I love him, I love her. And you are privileged this morning to be sitting here knowing that you are chosen. So the disciples were chosen as the foundation stones of a new kingdom that Jesus was bringing in. They were leaders of a new nation that Jesus was establishing. And as we read in Acts and in church history, their role was not always glamorous. And every one of those 12 disciples died a martyr's death, most of them in quite brutal ways. If you read what happened to them all, it wasn't a pleasant ending. However, theirs was the privilege of sitting at the feet of Jesus and taking the good news of the kingdom to the world. In the next paragraph, we, we see Jesus at the height of his ministry. He's been up the mountain, and we're not sure which mountain it is, and he's been there praying. And when he comes down from the mountain, there's a huge gathering of people. And this is really symbolic here of Moses coming down the mountain to deliver the Ten Commandments. And notice we have them coming from all over the region, all the way from Jerusalem to Tyre and Sidon, it says. So the whole area of, of the Middle East is, is, is where people are coming from. And hear, to hear him and be healed. And we're told that everyone was trying to touch him and that as they did so, they were healed and delivered as power was emanating from him. And he healed everybody, we're told. And this must have taken quite a while with such a huge crowd. It must have been exhausting for him. In fact, do you remember being at Jesus Calls ministry? How many people we prayed for? Yeah. There was hundreds of them. A long queue going all the way around the room. And at the end of it, we were completely exhausted. But Jesus has been up all night. And he's healed the whole massive crowd. He didn't go away and have a sleep. He sat down and began to talk them, teach them. I normally just want to sleep after such a meeting, but Jesus seemed to have extra energy to do what was required. And so he comes and he begins to teach. It says he taught the disciples, but I'm sure he was teaching everybody who was there on the mountain, at the foot of the mountain. And in a short block of teaching, Jesus gave four blessings and four woes. And this makes it quite different from the similar block of teaching in Matthew 5. We've already said that this is the start of Jesus constituting his new kingdom. He's chosen the 12, symbolic of the 12 tribes. And now he reiterates a new set of blessings and curses, which sig signify covenant obedience, just as Moses did in Deuteronomy 28 to 30. But Jesus' version of the blessings and, uh, and curses turns traditional wisdom on its head. When Jesus speaks of blessing coming, to, coming uh, to people, the criteria are if they are poor, hungry, weeping, or despised and rejected. Do we think of such people as being blessed? Those who are poor, those who are hungry, those who are weeping, those who are despised and rejected. But this is exactly what was prophesied in the Magnificat in Luke 2. 
Mary, in the, under the direction of the Holy Spirit, said, He scattered those who are proud in their innermost thoughts. He has brought down the rulers from their thrones, but has lifted up the humble. He's filled the hungry with good things, but has sent the rich away empty. Of course, Jesus himself proclaimed that his message was good news for the poor. And by poor here, he doesn't just mean those who are economically poor, but all those who are disenfranchised or who are outcasts. Jesus primarily came for the marginalized of society. And the woes are reserved for those who are rich, satisfied, laughing, or well thought of. And it's the complete opposite of what was expected by the crowds. Surely if people were rich, those were the signs of God's blessing. If people were poor, surely that was the sign that they were in disobedience. But the reality is the kingdom of God doesn't work how the world works. In fact, it works the other way up. The kingdom of God is not the place of power and wealth, but the place where the greatest among you should be like the youngest, and the one who rules like the one who serves. Jesus came to redefine how leadership works within society. And his discussion, if you read it carefully in, it, with Pilate in John 18, is an extended dialogue of what constitutes real authority. In that discussion, Pilate thinks he's in control as the governor of the greatest empire in the world. But in reality, Jesus demonstrates that he's in control and that Pilate has no authority except that which has been given him by God. And Jesus demonstrates this by humbling himself to go to the cross. See, the kingdom of God is not a place of domination and control, but of servanthood. There is no room for worldly style leadership in God's kingdom, and especially not in his church. Over the centuries, the church has had its fair share of the wrong kind of leadership, from the popes through to the prosperity teachers. Respect for and honor for leaders is important, but leadership must be shaped by willingness to serve. And the greatest tool a Christian leader has in his toolbox is his or her, or her example. How easy it, is it to submit to one another? How easy is it to serve one another? How easy is it to, to, to put someone else's good above our own? It's not always easy because what gets in the way is our ego. Within each one of us, self rises up and seeks to assert itself, especially when someone puts us down, ignores us, mistreats us, or doesn't affirm us. The way of the world is stand up for your rights. Be yourself. Don't let anyone judge you. The way of the kingdom is the opposite. When we're despised and rejected because of our faith or because of our righteous acts, that's the moment when we're most blessed. That's when God looks down on us and stores up for us a reward in heaven. This teaching, of course, is subversive. It was subversive in Jesus' day, and it's subversive uh, today because it's the opposite to the way the world thinks. It's the most uncomfortable part of coming into the kingdom. It's the bit we would rather was not there. Jesus, couldn't you have just have said, blessed are the rich? Blessed are those who were honored by the world. But no, Jesus turned it on its head. Most of us come into the kingdom on a ticket of the goodness of God, and we've sung about the goodness of God today, and there's nothing wrong with that. We're all in need of forgiveness, healing, and deliverance, and so on. And that's why huge crowds are gathered to see Jesus. However, like this crowd, once we've come to faith, there's also a different way of living. When we come into the kingdom, we take on a different set of values, attitudes, beliefs, and behaviors. We're no longer to walk as the world walks, but to be transformed by the renewal of our minds. For too long, the church has imported the values of the world into the church. And instead, the church needs to be a place where the values of the kingdom are demonstrated so that the world can see that there's a different way to live. In this passage, the blessings and the woes are contrasted in couplets. The poor are contrasted with the rich. The hungry are contrasted with the satisfied. Those who mourn are contrasted with those who laugh. 
and those who are despised and rejected because they belong to Jesus are contrasted with those who are well spoken of by society. In the world around us, it's the people in the latter group who are celebrated, but in the kingdom, it's the former group who will ultimately be blessed. And Jesus speaking, is speaking here both of the kingdom now and the kingdom to come. He's showing us how we are to live now, but also what his kingdom will be like when he returns. And ultimately, there will be justice for the downtrodden, the rejected, the poor, and the hungry. And if we feel we're in any of those categories today, we can rest assured in the knowledge that ultimately God will vindicate us. And we can also be assured that wherever the people of God are persecuted or disenfranchised because of their faith, God will bring justice to bear, and ultimately there will be justice in the universe. And I think particularly of my persecuted brothers and sisters around the world in that, that though they suffer now, God will bless them in the time to come. So the message of the kingdom is subversive. It's challenging. It goes against the grain, and it goes against what we're taught from childhood. But it's a message that brings blessing. Blessing now, and blessing in the age to come. Amen.